The year is 1994. I'm a 24-year-old Peace Corps volunteer, and I'm going to change the world. Six months before this photo, I was dressed in a blue suit, white shirt, red tie, IBM. Freshly met an undergraduate working in Milwaukee, helping to sell IBM systems. And you know what I realized? There was no way in hell I wanted to do that for the rest of my life. So I left and joined the Peace Corps. I went to the Peace Corps to try to find my mission, try to find my purpose. So I spent two years doing small business development around Central America, working predominantly with women, microfinance, helping them launch small businesses. Everywhere I went around Central America, I traveled this way. Anybody in Central America been on these chicken buses? Amazing experience. You can get everywhere with them. These little buses, they go to the tops of mountains, into the jungle, into beaches. It's amazing where you can get. But everywhere I went, everywhere I thought about making an impact in other people's lives, trying to find my purpose, guess what I found? Coca-Cola. Everywhere. The most remote village. I'm on a bus for five hours. I get off, I have to hike up with my backpack. I get up this little community, and there's Coke. Right? That's when I started to think about, I was interested in trying to make an impact. I was interested in trying to find my purpose. But I also wanted to do it at scale. How do I take what I was doing with these small communities and rural communities of Costa Rica and, and Guatemala and, and other places in Central America and think about it at scale? Now, during those ventures around Central America, I did see plenty of this, coconut water. Every beach around there had it all the time. And this should be the time I tell you, well, that's what, that was my big idea. Yeah, it wasn't quite the case. I didn't even like it then. Hardly drank it at all, but I saw it around there. It was great when I was out of range of medical care, got a little stomach illness that saved my life a few times. But it would be 10 years until I came up with the idea for Zika. But during that time, I did travel quite a bit around Latin America, quite a bit around Asia, and I saw coconuts everywhere. And I, start, I went on to have a cor another corporate job. I went back to business school. I wound up in a damn suit and tie again, working for International Paper, run, wound up back in Latin America, running a packaging business of all things for a number of years. But in the back of my mind, I kept thinking about, what is that purpose? What do I really want to do with my life? And it was through that process that my wife and I came up with the idea for Zico. And that was really rooted in a couple objectives. One was, we wanted to leverage what we were passionate about, healthy, natural, active living, and bring that to the world. Second of all, we had spent many years, most of our careers at that young age, in Latin America working in developing communities and felt like, what could we do to help people improve their lives? I also had committed myself to the business world and wanted to do this through the channel of, 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 of business. And we discovered coconut water, and we realized, wow, here's this amazing beverage known by a billion people across the world, high in potassium, high in electrolytes, no, no fat, super healthy, but people are still drinking Coke and Gatorade and other things in the US. What if we brought this to the world? So that was our vision. We set out to bring coconut water to the world, to build a brand and bring a product that represented healthy, natural, active living, to make an impact in the developing world, the 85 countries that grew coconuts, uh, and also build an organization that was amazing, a place where we and others could learn, earn, contribute, and grow. So I quit my corporate job, packed up my young family from El Salvador of all places, moved back to New York and launched Zico. Spent time sampling it everywhere I could. Demos, events, activations, yoga studios, uh, 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 college campuses, trying to figure out who likes this stuff? Where are we gonna go? Because there's one thing to have a purpose and there's another thing to put it into action. And to put this business into action, it was a family affair. My wife hates when I show this, this photo. Uh, John invited her today. I said, it's not good if she comes. She's not going to like this. <laughs> this is her and my daughters giving out Zico in Central Park uh, in, uh, in uh, around 2003 or four. right? It was a family affair. But little by little, we started to get some success with Zico. We got a few shelf displays in New York, little bo bodegas, little delis that started to sell it. But all along, I was trying to figure out who is our tribe? Who's the audience that we can really connect with that shares this higher purpose that we can engage with to help tell our mission? And it was yogis. 
So we started selling in these little uh, Bikram hot yoga studios. Um, it's 90 minutes, uh, 26 positions over 90 minutes and 103 degrees. It is not passive meditative yoga. This is hardcore sport. For the yogis in that world, you can imagine they're sweating. They need electrolytes. They need replenishment. At the time before this, they were drinking Gatorade or vitamin water during, cl during class and wa or, or water during class and vitamin water or Gatorade after class. For this audience, Gatorade's the Antichrist. Artificial colors, high sugar, weird bottles associated with all those uh, hardcore athletes John talked about, they were a different audience. They were interested in natural. They were interested in the tropics. They were interested in a brand that associated themselves with these communities and had a bigger mission. That was Zico. So we started in these yoga studios, and that's what we built around. We next followed a strategy that was inch wide, mile deep. Before we go everywhere, how do we go somewhere? So in New York City at that time, there were about 15 yoga studios. We focused on all of them. Went to every event, every activity, every weekend, got the yogi instructors involved, got the students involved, helped them in their charity events, helped yoga instructors go to school and get more training, all with the idea of building this community. And then around those communities, those yoga studios, we would look at every natural food store, every boat, bodega, every deli within a three block radius. How do we get Zico in those locations? And how do we start to build an audience in that very limited market that all would understand what we're trying to do, support us in some way, and ultimately, hopefully, drink Zico, right? Which, which is not, uh, anyone that's drank coconut water, it's not always the easiest thing to taste. Sometimes it took them three or four times until they fell in love with it. But from that, an initial focus, we started to get more distribution, bigger shelf displays, more velocity at retail, more success with, uh, with, uh, with these major retailers, and it built and started to snowball, still only in New York. So the next step became follow the yogis. So we went from New York and found other yoga communities around the country. All of a sudden, we started getting phone calls from San Francisco. I remember a yoga studio operator in San Francisco calling me and saying, "What? I, I got students coming in from New York, they're telling me they can no longer do Bikram yoga without Zico. What the hell is it and how do I get it? So we set up a UPS drop ship program, which we ran out of my garage in New Jersey, uh, pre-Amazon days, until we could seed those studios. But what we found is passionate followers that not only were supporting our brand, not only loved to drink Zico, but they supported the mission. They wanted to be part of communicating a bigger purpose of helping people drink healthy natural products, of supporting economic development in, in, in third world countries, and disrupting the food system. From there, we expanded to other audiences. We started to then reach out to ultra athletes, runner, cyclist, triathletes, kids, and, and, and eventually expanded into a pr pretty material brand. We brought in uh, Coca-Cola as a, a minority investor in 2009. And someone, I get, get the question sometimes, wait a second, how does working with Coke align with this purpose? Right, of, of affecting people's lives, of, of uh, developing economic opportunities in third world countries. Aren't they the enemy? My wife in 2003, before we launched, her background is public health. And she challenged me, she said, you know what, when I think about making an impact in public health, I can never imagine anything bigger than having the Coca-Cola company sell something healthy. So that was our mission from the beginning. Affect that change from within figure out how to leverage the power of Coca to distribute and make, let them make billions selling something healthy for a change. So, so we partnered with Coke. That allowed us to lever up some resources, lever up distribution. We brought celebrities on board and started to build the brand on a more wide uh, scale. We moved out to the West Coast and started to build out the West Coast. That allowed us to get more and more distribution and eventually we became uh, part of the Polar Bear Club. Um, so, um, so Coke purchased, like John mentioned, po Coke purchased Zico at the end of 2013. It's now a brand that they're expanding across the world. And I thought this was going to be my, my plan. I did write a book uh, called Crack Life Open, uh, High Hanging Fruit. My, my goal was to uh, crack life open. I'm going to go sit, sit on a beach and, and, uh, and uh, you know, have fun and get back to Central America and enjoy myself. But that wasn't my purpose. I still felt this drive to figure out how to even better leverage the power of business to make an impact in the world. So as John mentioned, I started a venture capital fund. I have, um, I'm a partner in probably the only plant-centric food and beverage venture capital fund in the world. We will only deal with uh, food and beverage brands that are based in plants. And some of these brands you may be familiar with, uh, Beyond Meat, Ripple, uh, uh, Rebel, 
What I'd like to tell you about, though, is three or four of these brands that are particularly successful, driven by purpose-driven entrepreneurs. And I want to tell you a little bit about their story. They are successful on a business basis, um, whether they're making money or not, they're creating economic value. But I'll tell you, these entrepreneurs would do it regardless. They're that committed to their purpose. Those are the people I look for. We look at 500 brands a year and invest in about three to five. They got to make, they got to hit the numbers. They got to resonate with consumers. They've got to have a great product and a great brand. But I will not work with entrepreneurs that are not purpose driven. It's not fun. And it's also, I believe, not as successful. So I want to tell you about a couple. Rebel. Um, little brands growing like crazy. Has anybody seen this brand yet? Okay, great, a few of you. Uh, you will in a few years, I promise you. Coconut milk based with adaptogenic herbs, just insanely delicious uh, product. But what's interesting, it was started by a guy that runs a nonprofit called Not For Sale. Dave Batstone started this organization because he was horrified to realize his local Thai restaurant in uh, the Bay Area was using slave labor. Slave labor in his little local Thai restaurant. So he decided to start an organization to eradicate human trafficking around the world. But he challenged a group of people and said, how do we do this differently? And one of the things they realized is a lot of the communities around the world that were at risk for, for, for human trafficking also grow these amazing herbs, turmeric, ashwagandha, um, uh, rhodiola. And so he set up a network to source those herbs, partnered with a guy that I know very well, and came up with this product. And you know what? The thing is, is exploding. It's phenomenal. So it was one of our first major investments. The company's probably going to do about uh, 35 million this year, over 15 last year. It'll do 50 next year. We told Coke, Pepsi, everybody to sit back and wait. We're going to scale this thing. And what's fascinating is the brand is amazing, the product is amazing, but what really resonates with consumers after those two is the, is the impact, is the purpose to eradicate human slavery. Thrive Market, anybody know that company uh, here in LA? Their mission is to democratize healthy living, right? Founders basically said, wait a second, Whole Foods is great, but who's buying that? It's the, it's the top one or three percent. How do we democratize that? So they build a business that gives access to that across the country, uh, zero to 100 million in one year. Um, Appeal, a company that the founder was horrified to realize food waste, came up with a technology to preserve avocados and ship them across the world. So now African uh, uh, countries can export to the global world market. It's going to be a billion dollar company. Um, Beyond Meat, um, Ethan Brown started this company because he is an animal rights activist. He's horrified by the fact that we use factory farming to feed ourselves. Started Beyond Meat based in El Segundo. This company just got a billion dollar valuation pre-IPO. These are examples of entrepreneurs that are making a dramatic difference in the world. And another one very close to home to me, Beanfield Snacks. My fund, we bought control of this company. It's a great based bean and rice based chip. But we also developed a partnership with a group called Homeboy Industries to help them create jobs for uh, men and women out of, out of gangs or out of jails. So these are examples of entrepreneurs, businesses that are making a massive difference in the food world, but they're doing it driven by purpose. And my view is, Look, the reality is a lot of these companies are going to get acquired. That's part of our way of changing the bigger system. But the fascinating thing is what happens in unison. When you have all these purpose-driven companies, little by little affecting the system, we can rebuild, rebuild not only just our food system, but industries across the world. And all of you as marketers can play a role in this with your own purpose, with your firm's purpose, with helping your brands and companies and partners find purpose, and I'm, I'm highly confident you can deliver a return in the process. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mark.